Hey guys, uh, welcome back. If you are following on from my part one video about dietary fiber, um, my name is Holly Baxter. I'm an accredited practicing dietitian and online physique coach, and this is part two um, of a three part video series which will, st which will discuss um, not only what dietary fiber is, uh, what are some good food sources, and how they actually uh, have a role in our health, um, but also how dietary fiber is labeled and then how it attributes to calories uh, on the nutrition information panel. So today I'm gonna to be look at, looking at how dietary fiber is labeled and carbohydrates for that matter. So let's start with the basics. So uh, what is dietary fiber on the label? Well, exactly as it reads, it is the total amount of dietary fiber found within a food product. We then can look at uh, carbohydrate and that is exactly what it reads. Total carbohydrate is the amount of carbohydrate contained within a food, including dietary fiber. And then the question that I'm always asked about, well, what is net carbohydrate? Net carbohydrate is the total amount of carbohydrate minus the amount of dietary fiber within a food. And it's often displayed on the front of um, product packaging um, essentially is a fancy way for food manufacturers to um, claim that they are more superior than their competitor. So an example with this would be um, a protein bar manufacturer um, might make the claim that their product is more superior because it contains only net grams, uh, net five grams of carbohydrates, while a competitor might only be able to claim uh, 15 grams net carbohydrate because their protein bar contains less um, carbohydrate from digestible carbohydrate sources um, and a greater amount of dietary fiber. So should we track dietary fiber as carbohydrate? This is a common question that I'm asked. So it is frequently assumed that dietary fiber contains zero calories. However, this is not an accurate statement. Dietary fiber actually yields about two to 2.5 calories per gram. Soluble fiber uh, is thought to be the greater provider of calories than insoluble fiber when it comes to the two types. Um, and that's due to its ability to be digested uh, through a process of fermentation by our gut microflora or the bacteria. Um, and this in turn um, produces uh, short chain fatty acids or SFAs. Um, and those SFAs can actually be reabsorbed across the intestinal lumen um, and then reused as energy if they are needed. So if we're in a state of caloric deficit um, and we didn't have enough um, carbohydrates or fats available and there are free, um, these, these um, short chain fatty acids available, um, we can actually use those as a form of energy. So uh, fiber isn't necessarily calorie free in that sense. So if you were having a lot of um, high fiber products or a lot of um, artificially sweetened products that also contained dietary fiber, um, you were still going to be getting calories from those foods. So hopefully I'll be able to educate you on how to actually track those um, and what your total calories um, or your total caloric intake is going to be if you do consume foods with this in it. So how much dietary fiber should you consume? Well, at the moment, the daily value is set to around 25 to 30 grams per day, but this is based on a 2000 uh, calorie diet. So depending on your nutritional requirements, um, your daily value might be higher um, or it might be lower than this amount. But uh, the statistics show that most Americans only consume around 10 to 15 grams per day. So I think um, the message here for all of us is to make sure that we are consuming plenty of dietary fiber um, and in the previous video that I, um, I did for you guys um, in part one, if you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. Um, it talks about the, the role of um, health, uh, sorry, the role of dietary fiber in our, um, in our health. So that's very interesting. So what can be declared as dietary fiber? So <laughs> dietary fiber that can be declared on the nutrition information label includes uh, certainly naturally occurring fibers. So these are intrinsic or intact and they come from plants um, as well as added um, isolated or synthetic non-digestible soluble and soluble insoluble fibers. So um, anything considered to be non-dietary fiber must be declared um, 
in the total carbohydrate section of the nutrition panel. So anything considered to be non-dietary fiber uh, must be listed as a total carbohydrate on the nutrition panel. It can't be listed um, as dietary fiber. So um, a food manufacturer, uh, just to reiterate, can only list dietary fiber if they can scientifically demonstrate that the source of dietary fiber being used in their product has a physiological effect um, that is beneficial or positive to human health, okay? So um, an example of a positive uh, physiological health benefit that dietary fiber includes in humans would be uh, lowering blood glucose or blood, uh, sorry, cholesterol levels. Uh, lowering blood pressure might be another one. Um, it might have an improved function, uh, improved bowel function, or um, an increased um, mineral absorption effect, or something of that nature. Um, but other physiological uh, endpoints could be added to this list um, if there is enough scientific data uh, to prove that it has that um, health effect on humans. So, prior to the current definition of dietary fiber, uh, the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, um, their regulations didn't contain any specific definition of dietary fiber, but it rather relied on analytical methods um, for measuring how much dietary fiber was actually present in the food. So therefore, um, an isolated or a non-synthetic dietary fiber or di a, a non-synthetic um, digestible carbohydrate could be added to foods and quantified as dietary fiber, even if it didn't necessarily provide a, um, a beneficial effect to human health. So the rules have changed in that sense and that there is now um, a definitive list of dietary fiber products that can be included on the labels and in foods. So I'm going to read out a list of dietary fibers that are included and can be declared on the nutrition facts label as dietary fiber. And if you want to see the extensive list, um, you can go to my website. I am putting up these articles on my website for you to view. It's free, so you don't have to, you don't have to pay for this. Um, so you can go and have a look at what actually is considered to be dietary fiber. So I'll just read off a couple. Um, there is a list of about 25 here. Um, apple fiber, bamboo fiber, um, cottonseed flour, pea fiber, oat hull fiber, rice, ban oh, rice bran fiber. Um, what else have we got? Uh, wheat fiber, sugarcane fiber, um, exanthin gum, and there's a whole list more. So they're just some of the options um, that Di um, food manufacturers can actually add to their foods and it would be considered dietary fiber. So what is the difference between naturally occurring fiber and added fiber? This is something that I've been asked in the past um, before too. So naturally occurring fiber is something that is um, intrinsic or intact. Uh, it inc it's uh, found in foods like vegetables, whole grains, fruits, cereal bran, flaked cereals, flowers, um, but essentially foods containing these natural dietary fibers, um, they've already been proven to have a beneficial um, effect on health. So food manufacturers don't actually need to be able to demonstrate that they have this effect. Um, only manufacturers um, using fibers that are added to their food product, either by isolating that food from their, um, their natural state or synthesizing them, they need to be able to demonstrate the beneficial physiological effect on health um, to meet that definition of dietary fiber. So um, there are a couple of other types of fibers as well um, that, the, that the FDA have allowed to be considered as dietary fiber. Um, these include things like cellulose, um, psyllium husk, pectin, guar gum, uh, locust bean gum, and um, there's a couple of others as well, I can't quite remember them. But again, they're listed on my website if you are interested in learning about these. Um, and they also meet that consideration too. And you'll see these listed on the ingredients panel of a lot of food products that are coming out uh, at the moment, especially those that claim to be high in fiber. Um, my question um, as a competitor and an athlete and someone generally interested in health was, I wonder how accurate um, the dietary fiber amount is that's listed on the label. So I did some research and I've actually spoken to the people from FDA and they were able to give me a really good, uh, good answer about this. So the analytical methods that are used to determine dietary fiber content of a food actually cannot distinguish the difference between the types of either non-digestible carbohydrates um, or foods that are digestible carbohydrates. So 
Therefore, food manufacturers must keep records of the foods that contain fibres which do comply with the regulatory definition of fibre, along with um, those non-digestible carbohydrates that do not meet the definition of dietary fibre. So we actually have to be able to see from their records of what's going into the foods, what is considered fibre and what is not, okay? Um, and the amount that is then declared on the product label must represent the amount that is quantified by those analytical methods minus the amount that does not meet the definition of dietary fiber. So that's how that is actually, um, that's how that's actually worked out. So uh, they are not prohibited to declare anything that is not considered a fiber based on those lists um, that I've just mentioned. Now I just wanted to briefly mention um, the compliance with these food labels and what the FDA has kind of recently come out with. So I believe it was 2014, uh, the FDA actually ordered all uh, food manufacturers with an annual food sales exceeding the amount of $10 million um, to comply with these new standards by July 2018. So this is the big, large multinational um, corporate companies. But for smaller companies, the cutoff date was extended to the following year, so July of 2019. However, I do believe that there have been a number of petitions against, um, against this ruling because companies felt that they were, um, it was going to be really expensive to recall all of their products um, that might have had incorrect labels. Um, and they also stated that it wasn't enough time to be able to reformulate their products in order to be able to make the same health claims. I think 12 months is very tight, but I think that that's a reasonable time frame um, to ask. However, um, unfortunately, this has meant that um, a number of the products are now mislabeled and are still available for sale. And the FDA, to my knowledge, someone correct me if, I'm, if I am wrong, um, but there has not been a revised cutoff date um, for these smaller food manufacturers to actually comply with these new labeling reg um, regulations. So, um, and that is something that I would like to know. <laughs> if you do know the answer to that, um, please do share um, because I think that that's really worthwhile and it gives us a sense of surety as to when we can expect all the labels to be uniform across the USA. And not only is this um, products that are um, actually made and manufactured in the US, if a company from Australia, for example, wanted to be able to sell their product in our country, uh, they do also have to be able to comply with the, the labeling registration uh, regulations for the USA. So uh, that sums up part two of this three-part video series um, of what um, the labeling requirements actually are uh, when it comes to dietary fiber and what can be considered um, fiber on food products. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you found this useful, please like, share, subscribe to my channel. Um, and also do go back and take a look at the other videos and perhaps the next video coming up which is how to actually track dietary fiber um, if you are somebody that tracks macros and how it affects our caloric intakes. Um, if you haven't subscribed to my uh, Instagram, please do. It is Holly T. Baxter. And if you have any other questions, you're more than welcome to contact me via my website. It is www.hbnutrition.com.au. Thanks for watching, guys.